Chapter 9 Imagination The imagination belongs to the general class of mental processes called the representative faculties, by which is meant the processes in which there are represented, or presented again, to consciousness impressions previously presented to it. As we have indicated elsewhere, the imagination is dependent upon memory for its materials, its records of previous impressions. But imagination is more than mere memory or recollection of these previously experienced and recorded impressions. There is, in addition to the representation and recollection, a process of arranging the recalled impressions into new forms and new combinations. The imagination not only gathers together the old impressions, but also creates new combinations and forms from the materials so gathered. Psychology gives us many hair-splitting definitions and distinctions between simple reproductive imagination and memory, but these distinctions are technical and as a rule perplexing to the average student. In truth, there is very little, if any, difference between simple reproductive imagination and memory, although when the imagination indulges in constructive activity, a new feature enters into the process which is absent in pure memory operations. In simple reproductive imagination, there is simply the formation of the mental image of some previous experience, the reproduction of a previous mental image. This differs very little from memory, except that the recalled image is clearer and stronger. In the same way, in ordinary memory, in a manifestation of recollection, there is often the same clear, strong mental image that is produced in reproductive imagination. The two mental processes blend into each other so closely that it is practically impossible to draw the line between them, in spite of the technical differences urged by the psychologists. Of course, the mere remembrance of a person who presents himself to one is nearer to pure memory than to imagination, for the process is that of recognition. But the memory, or remembrance, of the same person when he is absent from sight is practically that of reproductive imagination. Memory, in its stage of recognition, exists in the child mind before reproductive imagination is manifested. The latter, therefore, is regarded as a higher mental process. But still higher in the scale is that which is known as constructive imagination. This form of imagination appears at a later period of child mentation and is regarded as a later evolution of mental processes of the race. Gordy makes the following distinction between the two phases of imagination. The difference between reproductive imagination and constructive imagination is that the images resulting from reproductive imagination are copies of past experience, while those resulting from constructive imagination are not. To learn whether any particular image or combination of images is a product of reproductive or constructive imagination, all we have to do is to learn whether or not it is a copy of a past experience. Our memories, of course, are defective, and we may be uncertain on that account, but apart from that we need be in no doubt whatever. Many persons, hearing for the first time, the statement of psychologists that the imaginative faculties can represent and reproduce or recombine only the images which have previously been impressed upon the mind, are apt to object that they can, and frequently do, image things which they have not previously experienced. But can they, and do they? Is it not true that what they believe to be original creations of the imagination are merely new combinations of original impressions? For instance, no one ever saw a unicorn, yet someone originally imagined its form. But a little thought will show that the image of the unicorn is merely that of an animal having the head, neck and body of a horse, with the beard of a goat, the legs of a buck, the tail of a lion and a long tapering horn, spirally twisted, in the middle of the forehead. Each of the several parts of the unicorn exists in some living animal, although the unicorn, composed of all these parts, is non-existent outside of fable. In the same way, the centaur is composed of the body, legs and tail of the horse, and the trunk, head and arms of a man. 
The satyr has the head, body, and arms of a man, with the horns, legs, and hooves of a goat. The mermaid has the head, arms, and trunk of a woman, joined at the waist to the body and tail of a fish. The mythological devil has the head, body, and arms of a man, with the horns, legs, and cloven foot of the lower animal, and a peculiar tail composed of that of some animal, but tipped with a spearhead. Each of these characteristics is composed of familiar images of experience. The imagination may occupy itself for a lifetime, turning out impossible animals of this kind, but every part thereof will be found to correspond to something existent in nature, and experienced by the mind of the person creating the strange beast. In the same way, the imagination may picture a familiar person, or thing, acting in an unaccustomed manner, the latter having no basis in fact, so far as the individual person or thing is concerned, but being warranted by some experience concerning other persons or things. For instance, one may easily form the image of a dog swimming under water like a fish, or climbing a tree like a cat. Likewise, one may form a mental image of a learned, bewigged High Chancellor, or a venerable Archbishop of Canterbury, dressed like a clown, standing on his head, balancing a coloured football on his feet, sticking his tongue in his cheek, and winking at the audience. In the same way, one may imagine a railroad running across a barren desert, or a steep mountain, upon which there is not as yet a rail laid. The bridge across a river may be imaged in the same way. In fact, this is the way that everything is mentally created, constructed, or invented, the old materials being combined in a new way, and arranged in a new fashion. Some psychologists go so far to say that no mental image of memory is an exact reproduction of the original impression, that there are always changes due to the unconscious operation of the constructive imagination. The constructive imagination is able to tear things to pieces in search for material, as well as to join things together in its work of building. The importance of the imagination in all the processes of intellectual thought is great. Without imagination, man could not reason or manifest any intellectual process. It is impossible to consider the subject of thought without first regarding the processes of imagination. And yet, it is common to hear persons speak of the imagination as if it were a faculty of mere fancy, useless and without place in the practical world of thought. Developing the Imagination The imagination is capable of development and training. The general rules for development of the imagination are practically those which we have stated in connection with the development of the memory. There is the same necessity for plenty of material, for the formation of clear and deep impressions and clear-cut mental images, the same necessity for repeated impression and the frequent use and employment of the faculty. The practice of visualization, of course, strengthens the power of the imagination as it does that of the memory, the two powers being intimately related. The imagination may be strengthened and trained by deliberately recalling previous impressions and then combining them into new relations. The materials of memory may be torn apart and then recombined and regrouped. In the same way, one may enter into the feelings and thoughts of other persons by imagining oneself in their place and endeavouring to act out, in imagination, the life of such persons. In this way, one may build up a much fuller and broader conception of human nature and human motives. In this place, also, we should caution the student against the common waste of the powers of the imagination and the dissipation of its powers in idle fancies and daydreams. Many persons misuse their imagination in this way, and not only weaken its power for effective work, but also waste their time and energy. Daydreamers are notoriously unfit for the real practical work of life. Imagination and Ideals And finally, the student should remember that in the category of the imaginative powers must be placed that phase of mental activity which has so much to do with the making or marring of one's life, the formation of ideals. 
Our ideals are the patterns after which we shape our life. According to the nature of our ideals is the character of the life we lead. Our ideals are the supports of that which we call character. It is a truth, old as the race, are now being perceived most clearly by thinkers, that indeed, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The influence of our ideals is perceived to affect not only our character, but also our place and degree of success in life. We grow to be that of which we have held ideals. If we create an ideal, either of general qualities, or else these qualities, as manifested by some person living or dead, and keep that ideal ever before us, we cannot help developing traits and qualities corresponding to those of our ideal. Careful thought will show that character depends greatly upon the nature of our ideals. Therefore we see the effect of the imagination in character building. Moreover, our imagination has an important bearing on our actions. Many a man has committed an imprudent or immoral act which he would not have done had he been possessed of an imagination which showed him the probable results of the action. In the same way, many men have been inspired to great deeds and achievements by reason of their imagination picturing to them the possible results of certain action. The big things in all walks of life have been performed by men who had sufficient imagination to picture the possibilities of certain courses or plans. The railroads, bridges, telegraph lines, cable lines and other works of man are the results of the imagination of some men. The good fairy godmother always provides a vivid and lively imagination among the gifts she bestows upon her beloved godchildren. Well did the old philosopher pray to the gods. And withal, give unto me a clear and active imagination. The dramatic values of life depend upon the quality of the imagination. Life without imagination is mechanical and dreary. Imagination may increase the susceptibility to pain, but it pays for this by increasing the capacity for joy and happiness. The pig has but little imagination little pain and little joy. But who envies the pig? The man with a clear and active imagination is in a measure a creator of his world, or at least a re-creator. He takes an active part in the creative activities of the universe instead of being a mere pawn pushed here and there in the game of life. Again, the divine gift of sympathy and understanding depends materially upon the possession of a good imagination. One can never understand the pain or problems of another unless he first can imagine himself in the place of the other. Imagination is at the very heart of sympathy. One may be possessed of great capacity for feeling, but owing to his lack of imagination may never have this feeling called into action. The person who would sympathize with others must first learn to understand them and feel their emotions. This he can do only if he has the proper degree of imagination. Those who reach the heart of the people must first be reached by the feelings of the people. And this is possible only to him whose imagination enables him to picture himself in the same condition as others, and thus awaken his latent feelings and sympathies and understanding. Thus it is seen that the imagination touches not only our intellectual life but also our emotional nature. Imagination is the very life of the soul. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 The Feelings In thinking of the mind and its activities, we are accustomed to the general idea that the mental processes are chiefly those of intellect, reason, thought. But, as a fact, the greater part of the mental activities are those concerned with feeling and emotion. The intellect is the youngest child of the mind, and while making its presence strenuously known in the manner of all youngest children, so that one is perhaps justified in regarding it as the whole thing in the family, nevertheless it plays but a comparatively small part in the general work of the mental family. The activities of the feeling side of life greatly outnumber those of the thinking side, are far stronger in their influence and effect, as a rule, 
and, in fact, so colour the intellectual processes, unconsciously, so as to constitute their distinctive quality, except in the case of a very few advanced thinkers. But there is a difference between feeling and emotion, as the terms are employed in psychology. The former is the simple phase, the latter the complex. Generally speaking, the resemblance or difference is akin to that existing between sensation and perception, as explained in a previous chapter. Beginning with the simple, in order later on to reach the complex, we shall now consider that which is known as simple feeling. The term feeling, as used in this connection in psychology, has been defined as the simple agreeable or disagreeable side of any mental state. These agreeable or disagreeable sides of mental states are quite distinct from the act of knowing which accompanies them. One may perceive and thus know that another is speaking to him and be fully aware of the words being used and of their meaning. Ordinarily, and so far as pure thought processes are concerned, this would complete the mental state. But we must reckon on the feeling side as well as on the thinking side of the mental state. Accordingly, we find that the knowledge of the words of the other person and the meaning thereof results in a mental state agreeable or disagreeable. In the same way, the reading of the words of a book, the hearing of a song, or a sight or scene perceived may result in a more or less strong feeling, agreeable or disagreeable. This sense of agreeable or disagreeable consciousness is the essential characteristic of what we call feeling. It is very difficult to explain feeling except in its own terms. We know very well what we mean, or what another means, when it is said that we, or he, feel sad, or has a joyous feeling, or a feeling of interest and yet we shall find it very hard to explain the mental state except in terms of feeling itself. Our knowledge depends entirely upon our previous experience of the feeling. As an authority says, if we have never felt pleasure, pain, fear or sorrow, a quarto volume cannot make us understand what such a mental state is. Every mental state is not distinguished by strong feeling. There are certain mental states which are concerned chiefly with intellectual effort, and in which all trace of feeling seems to be absent, unless, as some have claimed, the feeling of interest, or the lack of same, is a faint form of the feeling of pleasure or pain. Habit may dull the feeling of a mental state until it is apparently neutral, but there is generally a faint feeling of like or dislike still left. The elementary forms of feeling are closely allied with those of simple sensation. But experiments have revealed that there is a distinction in consciousness. It has been discovered that one is often conscious of the touch of a heated object before he is of the feeling or pain resulting from it. Psychologists have pointed out another distinction, namely, when we experience a sensation, we are accustomed to refer it to the outside thing which is the object of it as when we touch the heated object. But when we experience a feeling, we instinctively refer it to ourselves, as when the heated object gives us pain. As an authority has said, my feelings belong to me, but my sensations seem to belong to the object which caused them. Another proof of the difference and distinction between sensation and feeling is the fact that the same sensation will produce different feelings in different persons experiencing the former, even at the same time. For instance, the same sight will cause one person to feel elated and the other depressed. The same words will produce a feeling of joy in one and a feeling of sorrow in another. The same sensation will produce different feelings in the same person at different times. An authority well says, you drop your purse and you see it lying on the ground as you stoop to pick it up, with no feeling either of pleasure or pain. But if you see it after you have lost it and have hunted for it a long time in vain, you have a pronounced feeling of pleasure. There is a vast range of degree and kind in feeling. Gordy says, all forms of pleasure and pain are called feelings. Between the pleasure which comes from eating a peach and that which results from solving a difficult problem, 
of learning good news of a friend, or thinking of the progress of civilization, between the pain that results from a cut in the hand and that which results from the failure of a long cherished plan or the death of a friend, there is a long distance. But the one group are all pleasures, the other all pains, and whatever the source of the pleasure or pain, it is alike feeling. There are many different kinds of feelings. Some arise from sensations of physical comfort or discomfort, some from purely physiological conditions, others from the satisfaction of accustomed tastes, or the dissatisfaction arising from the stimulation of unaccustomed tastes, others from the presence or absence of comfort, others from the presence or absence of things or persons for whom we have an affection or liking. Overindulgence often transforms the feeling of pleasure into that of pain, and, likewise, habit and practice may cause us to experience a pleasurable feeling from that which formerly inspired feeling of an opposite kind. Feelings also differ in degree. That is to say, some things cause us to experience pleasurable feelings of a greater intensity than do others, and some cause us to experience painful feelings of a greater intensity than do others. These degrees of intensity depend, more or less, upon the habit or experience of the individual. As a general rule, feeling may be classified into one, those arising from physical sensations, and two, those arising from ideas. The feelings depending upon physical sensations arise either from inherited tendencies and inclinations or from acquired habits and experience. It is an axiom of the evolutionary school that any physical activity that has been a habit of the race, long continued, becomes an instinctive pleasure-giving activity in the individual. For instance, the race, for many generations, was compelled to hunt, fish, travel, swim, etc., in order to maintain existence. The result is that we, the descendants, are apt to find pleasure in the same activities as sport, games, exercise, etc. Many of our tendencies and feelings are inherited in this way. To these we have added many acquired habits of physical activity which follow the same rule, that is, that habit and practice impart more or less pleasurable feeling. We find more pleasure in doing those things which we can do easily or quite well than in the opposite kind of things. The feelings, depending upon ideas, may also arise from inheritance. Many of our mental tendencies and inclinations have come down to us from the past. There are certain feelings that are born in one without a doubt. That is to say, there is a great capacity for such feelings which will be transformed into manifestation upon the presentation of the proper stimulus. Other mental feelings depend upon our individual past experience, association or suggestions from others, upon our past environment, in fact. The ideals of those around us will cause us to experience pleasure or pain, as the case may be, under certain circumstances. The force of suggestion along these lines is very strong indeed. Not only do we experience feelings in response to present sensations, but the recollection of some previous experience will also arouse feeling. In fact, feelings of this kind are closely bound up with memory and imagination. Persons of vivid imagination are apt to feel far more than others. They suffer more and enjoy more. Our sympathies which depend largely upon our imaginative power, are the cause of many of our feelings of this kind. Many of the facts which we generally ascribe to feeling are really part of the phenomena of emotion, the latter being the more complex phase of feeling. For purposes of this consideration, we have regarded simple feeling as the raw material of emotion, the relation being compared to that existing between sensation and perception. In our consideration of emotion, we shall see the fuller manifestation of feeling and its more complex expressions. End of chapter 10 End of section 4 Chapter 11 The Emotions As we have seen in the preceding lessons, an emotion is the more complex phase of feeling. As a rule, an emotion arises from a number of feelings, 
Moreover, it is of a higher order of mental activity. As we have seen, a feeling may arise either from a physical sensation or from an idea. Emotion, however, as a rule, is dependent upon an idea for its expression and always upon an idea for its direction and its continuance. Feeling, of course, is the elemental spirit of all emotional states and, as an authority has said, is the thread upon which the emotional states are strung. Halleck says, When representative ideas appear, the feeling in combination with them produces emotion. After the waters of the Missouri combine with another stream, they receive a different name, although they flow toward the gulf in as great volume as before. Suppose we liken the feeling due to sensation to the Missouri River, the train of representative ideas to the Mississippi before its junction with the Missouri. Emotion may then be likened to the Mississippi after its junction, after feeling has combined with representative ideas. The emotional stream will not be broader and deeper than before. This analogy is employed only to make the distinction clearer. The student must remember that mental powers are never actually as distinct as two rivers before their union. The student must beware of thinking that we have done with feeling when we consider emotion. Just as the waters of the Missouri flow on until they reach the gulf, so does feeling run through every emotional state. In the above analogy, the term representative ideas, of course, means the ideas of memory and imagination as explained in previous chapters. There is a close relation between emotion and the physical expression thereof. A peculiar mutual action and reaction between the mental state and the physical action accompanying it. Psychologists are divided regarding this relation. One school holds that the physical expression follows and results from the mental state. For instance, we hear or see something and thereupon experience the feeling or emotion of anger. This emotional feeling reacts upon the body and causes an increased heartbeat, a tight closing of the lips, a frown and lowered eyebrows and clenched fists. Or we may perceive something which causes the feeling or emotion of fear, which reacts upon the body and produces pallor, raising of the hair, dropping of the jaw, opening of the eyelids, trembling of the legs, etc. According to this school and the popular idea, the mental state precedes and causes the physical expression. But another school of psychology, of which the late Professor William James is a leading authority, holds that the physical expression precedes and causes the mental state. For instance, in the cases above cited, the perception of the anger-causing or fear-causing sight first causes a reflex action upon the muscles, according to inherited race habits of expression. This muscular expression and activity, in turn, is held to react upon the mind and to cause the feeling or emotion of anger or fear, as the case may be. Professor James, in some of his works, makes a forcible argument in support of this theory, and his opinions have influenced the scientific thought of the day upon this subject. Others, however, have sought to combat his theory by equally forcible argument and the subject is still under lively and spirited discussion in psychological circles. Without taking sides in the above controversy, many psychologists proceed upon the hypothesis that there is a mutual action and reaction between emotional mental states and the appropriate physical expression thereof, each in a measure being the cause of the other, and each, likewise, being the effect of the other. For instance, in the cases above cited, the perception of the anger-producing or fear-producing sight causes, almost or quite simultaneously, the emotional mental state of anger or fear, as the case may be, and the physical expression thereof. Then rapidly ensues a series of mental and physical reactions. The mental state acts upon the physical expression and intensifies it. The physical expression, in turn, reacts upon the mental state and induces a more intense degree of the emotional feeling. And so on, until the mental state and physical expression reach their highest point and then begin to subside from exhaustion of energy. This middle ground conception meets all the requirements of the facts 
and is probably more nearly correct than either extreme theory. Darwin, in his classic work, The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals, has thrown a great light on the subject of the expression of emotion in physical motions. The Florentine scientist, Paolo Mantegazza, added to Darwin's work with ideas of his own, and countless examples drawn from his own experience and observation. The work of François del Sartre, the founder of the school of expression which bears his name, is also a most valuable addition to the thought on this subject. The subject of the relation and reaction between emotional feeling and physical expression is a most fascinating one, and one in which we may expect interesting and valuable discoveries during the next twenty years. The relation and reaction above mentioned are interesting, not only from a viewpoint of theory, but also because of their practicable application in emotional development and training. It is an established truth of psychology that each physical expression of an emotional state serves to intensify the latter. It is pouring oil on the fire. Likewise, it is equally true that the repression of the physical expression of an emotion tends to restrain and inhibit the emotion itself. Halleck says, if you watch a person growing angry, we shall see the emotion increase as he talks loud, frowns deeply, clenches his fist, and gesticulates wildly. Each expression of his passion is reflected back upon the original anger and adds fuel to the fire. If he resolutely inhibits the muscular expressions of his anger, it will not attain great intensity, and it will soon die a quiet death. Not without reason are those persons, called cold-blooded, who habitually restrain, as far as possible, the expression of their emotion, who never frown or throw any feeling into their tones, even when a wrong inflicted upon someone demands aggressive measures. There is here no way of bodily expression to flow back and augment the emotional state. In this connection we call your attention to the familiar and oft-quoted passage from the works of Professor William James. Refuse to express a passion, and it dies. Count ten before venting your anger, and its occasion seems ridiculous. Whistling to keep up courage is no mere figure of speech. On the other hand, sit all day in a moping posture, sigh and reply to everything with a dismal voice, and your melancholy lingers. There is no more valuable precept in moral education than this, as all who have experience know. If we wish to conquer undesirable emotional tendencies in ourselves, we must assiduously, and in the first instance cold-bloodedly, go through the outward movements of those contrary dispositions which we prefer to cultivate. Smooth the brow, brighten the eye, contract the dorsal rather than the ventral aspect of the frame, and speak in a major key, and your heart must be frigid indeed if it does not gradually thaw. Along the same lines, Halleck says, Actors have frequently testified to the fact that emotion will arise if they go through the appropriate muscular movements. In talking to a character on the stage, if they clench the fists and frown, they often find themselves becoming really angry. If they start with counterfeit laughter, they find themselves growing cheerful. A German professor says that he cannot walk with a schoolgirl's mincing step and air without feeling frivolous. The wise student will acquire a great control over his emotional nature if he will re-read and study the above statements and quotations until he has grasped their spirit and essence. In those few lines he is given a philosophy of self-control and self-mastery that will be worth much to him if he will but apply it in practice. Patience, perseverance, practice and will are required but the reward is great. Even to those who have not the persistency to apply this truth fully, there will be a partial reward if they will use it to the extent of restraining, so far as possible, any undue physical expression of undesirable emotional excitement. Some writers seem to regard capacity for great emotional excitement and expression as a mark of a rich and full character or noble soul. This is far from being true while it is a fact that the cultivation of certain emotions tends to create a noble character and a full life, 
it is equally true that the tendency to gush and indulge in hysterical or sentimental excesses is a mark of an ill-controlled nature and a weak rather than strong character. Moreover, it is a fact that excess in emotional excitement and expression tends toward the dissipation of the finer and nobler feelings which otherwise would seek an outlet in actual doing and practical action. In the language of the old Scotch engineer in the story, they are like the old locomotive which has been so much steam at the whistle that she has nothing to gear by. Emotional excitement and expression are largely dependent upon habit and indulgence, although there is a great difference, of course, in the emotional nature and tendencies of various persons. Emotions, like physical actions or intellectual processes, become habitual by repetition, and habit renders all physical or mental actions easy of repetition. Each time one manifests anger, the deeper the mental path is made, and the easier it is to travel that path the next time. In the same way, each time that anger is conquered and inhibited, the easier will it be to restrain it the next time. In the same way, desirable habits of emotion and expression may be formed. Another point in the cultivation, training and restraint of the emotions is that which has to do with the control of the ideas which we allow to come into the mind. Ideative habits may be formed, are formed, in fact, by the majority of persons. We may cultivate the habit of looking on the bright side of things, of looking for the best in those we meet, of expecting the best things instead of the worst by resolutely refusing to give welcome to ideas calculated to arouse certain emotions, feelings, passions, desires, sentiments, or similar mental states, we may do much to prevent the arousing of the emotion itself. Emotions usually are called forth by some idea, and if we shut out the idea, we may prevent the emotional feeling from appearing. In this connection, the universal rule of psychology may be applied. A mental state may be inhibited or restrained by turning the attention to the opposite mental state. The control of the attention is really the control of every mental state. We may use the will in the direction of the control of the attention, the development and direction of voluntary attention, and thus actually control every phase of mental activity. The will is nearest to the ego, or central being of man and the attention is the chief tool and instrument of the will. This fact cannot be repeated too often. If it is impressed upon the mind, it will prove to be useful and valuable in many emergencies of mental life. He who controls his attention controls his mind, and in controlling his mind, controls himself. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 The Instinctive Emotions Many attempts to classify the emotions have been made by the psychologists, but the best authorities hold that beyond the purpose of ordinary convenience in considering the subject, any classification is scientifically useless by reason of its incompleteness. As James cleverly puts it, any classification of the emotions is seen to be as true and as natural as any other, if it only serves some purpose. The difficulty attending the attempt at classification arises from the fact that every emotion is more or less complex and is made up of various feelings and shades of emotional excitement. Each emotion blends into others. Just as a few elements of matter may be grouped into hundreds of thousands of combinations, so the elements of feeling may be grouped into thousands of shades of emotion. It is said that the two elements of carbon and hydrogen form combinations resulting in 5,000 varieties of material substance, from anthracite to marsh gas, from black coke to colourless naphtha. The same thing may be said of the emotional combinations formed from two principal elements of feeling. Moreover, the close distinction between sensation and feeling, on the one hand, and between feeling and emotion, on the other, serves to further complicate the task. For the purposes of our consideration, let us divide the emotions into five general classes, as follows. 1. Instinctive emotions. 2. Social emotions. 3. Religious emotions. 4. 
aesthetic emotions, 5. intellectual emotions. We shall now consider each of the above five classes in turn. The instinctive emotions. Instinct is defined as unconscious, involuntary, or unreasoning prompting to any action, or the natural unreasoning impulse by which an animal is guided to the performance of any action, without thought of improving the method. An authority says, Instinct is a natural impulse leading animals, even prior to all experience, and to perform certain actions tending to the welfare of the individual or the perpetuation of the species, apparently without understanding the object at which they may be supposed to aim, or deliberating as to the best methods to employ. In many cases, as in the construction of the cells of the bee, there is a perfection about the result which reasoning man could not have equalled, except by an application of the higher mathematics to direct the operations carried out. Mr. Darwin considers that animals, in time past, as now, have varied in their mental qualities, and that those variations are inherited. Instincts also vary slightly in a state of nature. This being so, natural selection can ultimately bring them to a high degree of perfection. It was formerly the fashion to ascribe instinct in the lower animals, and in man, to something akin to innate ideas implanted in each species, and thereafter continued by inheritance. But the application of the idea of evolution to the science of psychology has resulted in brushing away these old ideas. Today, it holds that that which we call instinct is a result of gradual development in the course of evolution, the accumulated experience of the race being stored away in the race memory, each individual adding a little thereto by his acquired habits and experiences. Psychologists now hold that the lower forms of these race tendencies are closely akin to purely reflex actions, and the higher forms, which are known as instinctive emotions, are phenomena of the subconscious mind resulting from race memory and race experience. Claude says, Instinct is the higher form of reflex action. The salmon migrates from sea to river. The bird makes its nest or migrates from one zone to another by an unvarying route, even leaving its young behind to perish. The bee builds its six-sided cell. The spider spins its web. The chick breaks its way through the shell, balances itself, and picks up grains of corn. The newborn babe sucks its mother's breast all in virtue of like acts on the part of their ancestors, which, arising in the needs of the creature, and gradually becoming automatic, have not varied during long ages, the tendency to repeat them being transmitted within the germ from which insect, fish, bird, and man have severally sprung. Schneider says, It is a fact that men, especially in childhood, fear to go into a dark cavern or a gloomy wood, this feeling of fear arises, to be sure, partly from the fact that we easily suspect that dangerous beasts may lurk in these localities, a suspicion due to stories we have heard and read. But, on the other hand, it is quite sure that this fear, at a certain perception, is also directly inherited. Children who have been carefully guarded from all ghost stories are nevertheless terrified and cry if led into a dark space especially if sounds are made there. Even an adult can easily observe that an uncomfortable timidity steals over him in a lonely wood at night, although he may have the fixed conviction that not the slightest danger is near. This feeling of fear occurs in many men, even in their own houses, after dark, although it is much stronger in a dark cavern or forest. The fact of such instinctive fear is easily explicable when we consider that our savage ancestors, through immemorial generations, were accustomed to meet with dangerous beasts in caverns, especially bears, and were, for the most part, attacked by such beasts during the night and in the woods, and that thus an inseparable association between the perceptions of darkness, caverns, woods, and fear took place, and was inherited. James says, Nothing is commoner than the remark that man differs from lower creatures by the almost total absence of instincts and the assumption of their work in him by reason. 
we may confidently say that however uncertain man's reactions upon his environment may sometimes seem in comparison with those of the lower mammals the uncertainty is probably not due to their possession of any principles of action which he lacks on the contrary man possesses all the impulses that they have and a great many more besides high places cause fear of a peculiarly sickening sort though here again individuals differ the utterly blind instinctive character of the motor impulses here is shown by the fact that they are almost always entirely unreasonable but that reason is powerless to suppress them certain ideas of supernatural agency associated with real circumstances produce a peculiar kind of horror this horror is probably explicable as a result of a combination of simple horrors to bring the ghostly terror to its maximum many unusual elements of the dreadful must combine such as loneliness darkness inexplicable sounds especially of a dismal character moving pictures half discerned or if discerned of dreadful aspect and a vertiginous baffling of the expectation in view of the fact that cadaveric reptilian and underground horrors play so specific and constant a part in many nightmares and forms of delirium it seems not altogether unwise to ask whether these forms of dreadful circumstance may not at a former period have been more normal objects of the environment than now the evolutionist ought to have no difficulty in explaining these terrors and the scenery that provokes them as relapses into the consciousness of the cave men a consciousness usually overlaid in us by experiences of a more recent date instinctive emotion manifests as an impulse arising from the dim recesses of the feeling or emotional nature an incentive toward a dimly conscious end it differs from the almost purely automatic nature of certain forms of reflex process for its beginning is a feeling arising from the subconscious regions which strives to excite an activity of conscious volition the feeling is from the subconscious but the activity is conscious the end may not be perceived in consciousness or at least is but dimly perceived but the action leading to the end is in full consciousness instinct is seen to have its origin in the past experiences of the race transmitted by heredity and preserved in the race memory it has for its object the preservation of the individual and of the species its end is often something far removed in time from the moment or the welfare of the species rather than that of the individual for instance the caterpillar providing for its future states or the bird building its nest or the bees building cells and providing honey for their successors for very few bees live to partake of the honey which they have gathered and stored they are animated by the spirit of the hive the most elementary forms of the instinctive emotions are those which have to do with the preservation of the individual his comfort and purely physical welfare this class of emotions comprises what are generally known as purely selfish feelings having little or no concern for the welfare of others in this class we find the emotional feelings which have to do with the satisfaction of hunger and thirst the securing of comfortable quarters and warm clothing and the spirit of combat and strife arising from the desire to obtain these these elemental feelings had their birth early in the history of life and indeed life itself depended very materially upon them for its preservation and continuance it was necessary for the primitive living thing to be selfish when man appeared only those survived who manifested these feelings strongly the others were pushed to the wall and perished even in our civilization the man below the average in this class of feelings will find it difficult to survive end of chapter 12 end of section 5 chapter 13 the passions arising from the most elemental instinctive emotions we find what may be termed the passions by the term passion is meant those strong feelings in which the elemental selfish instincts are manifested in relation to other persons either in the phase of attraction or repulsion in this class we find the elementary phases of love and the feelings of hate anger jealousy 
revenge, etc. This class of emotions usually manifests violently as compared with the other emotions. The passions generally arise from self-preservation, race preservation and reproduction, self-interest, self-aggrandizement, etc., and may be regarded as a more complex phase of the elemental instinctive emotions. The elemental instinctive emotions of self-preservation and self-comfort cause the individual to experience and manifest the passional emotions of desire for combat, anger, hate, revenge, etc., while the instinctive emotions leading to reproduction and continuance of the race give rise to the passional emotions of sexual love, jealousy, etc. The desire to attract the other sex increases ambition, vanity, love of display, and other feelings. It is only when this class of emotions blends with the higher emotions that the passions become purified and refined. But it must not be forgotten that these emotions were very necessary for the welfare of the race in the early stage of its evolution, and that they still play an active part in human life, under the greater or less restraint imposed by civilized society. Nor should it be forgotten that from these emotions have evolved the highest love of one human being for another. From instinctive sexual love and the racial instinct have developed the higher affection of man for woman and woman for man in all their beautiful manifestations and the love of the parent for the child and the love of the child for the parent the first manifestation of altruism arises in the love of the living creature for its mate and in the love of the parents for their offspring in certain forms of life where the association of the sexes is merely for the moment and is not followed by protection mutual aid and companionship, there is found an absence of mutual affection of any kind, the only feeling being an elemental reproductive instinct bringing the male and female together for the moment, an almost purely reflex activity. In the same way, in the cases of certain animals, the rattlesnake for instance, in which the young are able to protect themselves from birth, there is seen a total absence of parental affection or the return thereof. Human love between the sexes, in its higher and lower degrees, is a natural evolution from passional emotion of a low order, due to the growth of social, ethical, moral and aesthetic emotion arising from the necessities of the increasing complexity and development of human life. The simpler forms of passional emotion are almost entirely instinctive in their manifestation. Indeed, in many cases, there appears to be but little more than a high form of reflex nervous action. The following words of William James give us an interesting view of this fact of life. The cat runs after the mouse, runs or shows fight before the dog, avoids falling from walls and trees, shuns fire and water, not because he has any notion either of life or of death or of self-preservation. He acts in each case separately and simply because he cannot help it, being so framed that when that particular running thing, called a mouse, appears in his field of vision, he must pursue, that when that particular barking and obstreperous thing, called a dog, appears there, he must retire, if at a distance, and scratch, if close by that he must withdraw his feet from water and his face from flame, etc. Now, why do the various animals do what seem to us such strange things in the presence of such outlandish stimuli? Why does the hen, for instance, submit herself to the tedium of incubating such a fearfully uninteresting set of objects as a nestful of eggs, unless she have some sort of prophetic inkling of the result? The only answer is ad hominem. We can only interpret the instinct of brutes by what we know of instincts in ourselves. Why do men always lie down, when they can, on soft beds rather than on soft floors? Why do they sit around a stove on a cold day? Why, in a room, do they place themselves, ninety-nine times out of a hundred, with their faces towards the middle rather than to the wall? Why does the maiden interest the youth so much? that everything about her seems more important and significant than anything else in the world. Nothing more can be said than that these are human ways, 
and that every creature likes its own ways, and takes to following them as a matter of course. Science may come and consider these ways, and find that most of them are useful. But it is not for the sake of their utility that they are followed, but because at the moment of following them we feel that it is the only appropriate and natural thing to do. Not one man in a million, when taking his dinner, ever thinks of its utility. He eats because the food tastes good and makes him want more. If you should ask him why he wants to eat more of what tastes like that, instead of revering you as a philosopher, he will probably laugh at you for a fool. James continues, he takes, in short, what Berkeley called a mind debauched by learning to carry the process of making the natural seem strange, so far as to ask the why of any instinctive human act. To the metaphysician alone can such questions arise as, why do we smile when pleased and not scowl? Why are we unable to talk to a crowd as to a single friend? Why does a particular maiden turn our wits upside down? The common man can only say, of course we smile, of course our heart palpitates at the sight of the crowd, of course we love the maiden, that beautiful soul clad in that perfect form, so palpably and flagrantly made from all eternity to be loved. And so, probably, does each animal feel about the particular things it tends to do in the presence of particular objects. They, too, are a priori syntheses. To the lion, it is the lioness which is made to be loved. To the bear, the she-bear. To the broody hen, the notion would seem monstrous that there should be a creature in the world to whom a nestful of eggs was not the utterly fascinating, precious, and never to be much sat upon object which it is to her. Thus we may be sure that however mysterious some animal's instincts may appear to us, our instincts will appear no less mysterious to them. And we may conclude that to the animal which obeys it, every impulse and every step of that instinct shines with its own sufficient light, and seems, at the moment, the only externally right and proper thing to do. It may be done for its own sake exclusively. One has very little need, as a rule, to develop the passional emotions. Instinct has taken pretty good care that we shall have our share of this class of feelings. But there is a need to train, restrain, govern, and control these emotions, for the conditions which brought about their original being have changed. Our social conventions require that we should subordinate these passional feelings, to some extent at least. Society insists that we must restrict our love impulses to certain limits and to certain quarters, and that we subdue our anger and hate, except toward the enemies of our land, the disturbers of public peace, and the menaces of the social conventions of our time and land. The public welfare requires that we inhibit our fighting impulses, except in cases of self-defence or war. Public policy requires that we keep our ambitions within reasonable limits, which limits change from time to time, of course. In short, society has stepped in and insisted that man, as a social being, must not only acquire a social conscience, but must also develop sociable emotions and inhibit his unsociable ones. The evolution of man's nature has caused him, unconsciously, to modify his elemental, instinctive, passional emotions and subordinate them to the dictates of social, ethical, moral, and aesthetic feelings and ideals, and to intellectual considerations. Even the original elemental instincts of the lower animals have been modified by reason of the social requirements of the pack, herd, or drove, until the modified instinct is now the ruling force. The general principles of emotional control, restraint, and mastery as given in a preceding chapter, are applicable to the particular class of emotions now under consideration here. 1. By refraining from a physical expression, one may, at least partially, inhibit the emotion. 2. By refusing to create the habit, one may more easily manifest control. 3. By refusing to dwell upon the idea or mental picture of the exciting object, one may lessen the stimulus. 4. 
by cultivating the opposite class of emotions one may inhibit any class of feeling five and finally by acquiring a control of the attention by means of the will one has the reins firmly in hand and may drive or hold back the steeds of passion as he wills the passions are like fiery horses useful if well under control but most dangerous if the control is lost the ego is the driver the will his hands attention the reins habit the bit and the passions the horses to drive the chariot of life under social conditions the ego must have strong hands will to tighten or loosen the reins of attention he must also employ a well-designed and shaped bit of habit without strong hands good reins and well-adjusted bit the fiery steeds of passion may gain control and running away dash the chariot and its driver over the precipice and on to the jagged rocks below End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 The Social Emotions As man became a social animal, he developed new traits of character, new habits of action, new ideals, new customs, and consequently, new emotions. Emotions long entertained and long manifested by the race become more or less instinctive and are passed along in the form of either a inherited stimulus akin to but lesser in degree and force than the more elemental emotions or b of inherited tendency to manifest the acquired emotional feeling upon the presentation of sufficiently strong stimuli hence arises that which we have called the social emotions under the classification of the social emotions are those acquired tendencies of action and feeling of the race which are more or less altruistic and are concerned with the welfare of others and one's duties and obligations towards society and our fellow men in this class are to be found the emotions which impel us to perform what we consider or feel to be our duty toward our neighbours and our obligations and duty toward the state as expressed in its laws the customs of men of our country or the ideals of the community in another phase it manifests as sympathy fellow feeling and kindness in general in its first phase we find civic virtue law-abiding inclination honesty square dealing and patriotism in its second phase we find sympathy for others charity mutual aid the alleviation of poverty and suffering the erection of asylums for orphans and the aged hospitals for the sick and the formation of societies for general charitable work in many cases we find the social ethical and moral emotions closely allied with religious emotion and by many these are supposed to be practically identical but there is a vast difference in spite of their frequent association for instance we find many persons of high civic virtue of exalted moral ideals and manifesting ethical qualities of the most advanced type who are lacking in the ordinary religious feelings on the other hand we too frequently find persons professing great religious zeal and apparently experiencing the most intense religious emotional feeling who are deficient in social civic ethical and moral qualities in the best sense of these terms the aim of all religion worthy of the name however is to encourage ethical and moral as well as religious emotions we must here make the distinction between those manifesting the actions termed ethical and moral because they feel that way and those who merely comply with the conventional requirements because they fear the consequences of their violation the first class have the true social ethical and moral feelings tastes ideals and inclinations while the second manifest merely the elementary feelings of self-preservation and selfish prudence the first class are good because they feel that way and find it natural to be so while the others are good merely because they have to be or be punished by legal penalty or public opinion loss of prestige loss of financial support etc 
the social, moral, and ethical emotions are believed to have arisen in the race by reason of the association of individuals and communities and the rise of the necessity for mutual aid and forbearance. Even many of the species of the lower animals have social, moral, or ethical codes of their own based on the experience of the species or family, infractions of which they punish severely. In the same way, sympathy and the altruistic feelings are supposed to have arisen. The community of interest and understanding in the tribe, family, or clan brought not only the feeling of natural defence and protection, but also the finer, inner sympathetic feeling of the pains and sufferings of their associates. This, in the progress of the race, has developed into broader and more complex ideals and feelings. Theology explains the moral feelings as resulting from conscience, which it holds to be a special faculty of the mind, or soul, divinely given. Science, while admitting the existence of the state of feelings which we call conscience, denies its supernatural origin and ascribes it to the result of evolution, heredity, experience, education and suggestion. Conscience, according to science, is a compound of intellectual and emotional states. Conscience is not an invariable or infallible guide, but depends entirely upon the heredity, education, experience and environment of the individual. It accompanies the moral and ethical codes of the race, which vary with time and with country. Actions which were thought right a century ago are condemned now. Likewise, things condemned a century ago are thought right now. What is commended in Turkey is condemned in England, and vice versa. Moral tastes and ideals, like aesthetic ones, vary with time and country. There is no absolute code which has always been true, in all places. There is an evolution in the ideals of morals and ethics as in everything else, and conscience and the moral and ethical emotions accompany the changing ideals. Many of the moral and ethical principles originally arose from necessity or utility, but have since developed into natural spontaneous feeling on the part of the race. It is held that the race is rapidly developing a social conscience, which will cause the wiping out of many social conditions which are now the disgrace of civilization. It is predicted that in time the race will look back upon the existence of poverty in our civilization as our generation now looks back upon the existence of slavery, imprisonment for debt, capital punishment for the theft of a loaf of bread, the killing of prisoners of war, etc. It is thought that, in time, wars of conquest will be deemed as utterly immoral as today is regarded the murder of a body of men by a band of pirates or bandits. In the same way, the economic slavery of today will be seen as immoral as now seems the physical slavery of the past. In not far distant time, it will seem incredible that society could ever have allowed one of its members to die of hunger in the streets, or of poverty and inattention in the sick room of the hovel. Not only will the ideals and feelings of ethical and moral responsibility change and evolve, but the feelings of personal sympathy will evolve in accordance therewith. At least such is the dream and prophecy of some of the world's greatest thinkers. The social, ethical and moral emotions may be developed by a study of the evolution and meaning of society on the one hand, and a perception of the condition of the lives of less fortunate individuals on the other. The first will awaken new ideas of the history and real meaning of social association and mutual intercourse, and will develop a new sense of responsibility, duty, and civic and social pride. The second will awaken understanding and sympathy, and a desire to do what one can to help those who are the underdog, and also to bring about a better state of affairs in general. The study of history and civilization, of sociology and civics, will do much in the first direction. The study of humankind and its life problems and conditions will do the same thing in the second case. In both cases, there will be awakened a new sense of right and wrong, a new conception of ought and ought not, regarding one's relations to the race, society, and his fellow beings. 
Let no one deceive himself or herself by the smug assumption that the race has entirely emerged from barbarism and is now on the top wave of civilization. The truth, as known to all careful and conscientious thinkers, is that we are but half civilized, if indeed that much. Many of our customs and conventions are those of a half barbarous people. Our ideals are low, our customs often vile. We lack not only high ideals, but in many cases we show a lack of sanity in our social conventions. But evolution is moving us slowly ahead. A better day is dawning. The signs are in the air, to be seen by all thoughtful men. Civilization is climbing the ladder, aided by the evolution of the social, ethical and moral emotions and the development of the intellect. In connection with this phase of the emotions, we invite the student to consider the following excellent words of Professor Davidson in his History of Greek Education. It is not enough for a man to understand the conditions of rational life in his own time. He must likewise love these conditions and hate whatever leads to life of an opposite kind. This is only another way of saying that he must love the good and hate the evil. For the good is simply what conduces to rational or moral life, and the evil simply what leads away from it. It is perfectly obvious, as soon as it is pointed out, that all immoral life is due to a false distribution of affection, which again is often, though by no means always, due to a want of intellectual cultivation. He that attributes to anything a value greater or less than it really possesses in the order of things, has already placed himself in a false relation to it, and will certainly, when he comes to act with reference to it, act immorally. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 The Religious Emotions By the religious emotions is meant that class of emotional feeling arising from the faith and belief in, or consciousness of the presence of supernatural beings, powers, entities, or forces. This form of emotion is regarded as distinct from the ethical and moral emotions, although frequently found in connection therewith. Likewise, it is independent of any special form of intellectual belief, for it is far more fundamental and often exists without creed, philosophy, or stated belief, the only manifestation in such cases being a feeling of the existence of supernatural beings, forces, and powers to which man has a relation and to which he owes obedience. To those who may think that this is too narrow a conception of religious emotion, we refer the following definition of religion from the dictionaries. The acts or feelings which result from the belief of a god or gods having superior control over matter, life, or destiny. Religion is subjective, designating the feelings and acts of men which relate to God. Theology is objective, denoting the science which investigates the existence, laws, and attributes of God. Or, objectively, the outer form and embodiment which the inward spirit of a true or false devotion assumes. Subjectively, the feeling of veneration with which the worshipper regards the being he adores. Darwin, in his Descent of Man, says that the feeling of religious devotion is a highly complex one, consisting of love, complete submission to an exalted and mysterious superior, a strong sense of dependence, fear, reverence, gratitude, hope for the future, and perhaps other elements. He is of the opinion that no man can experience so complex an emotion until advanced in his intellectual and moral faculties to at least a moderately high level. The authorities generally agree with Darwin, although the most recent study of the history of religion has shown that religious feeling has a far more primitive origin than that indicated by Darwin. It is true that the lower animals are not deemed capable of anything approaching religious feeling, unless there is a feeling approaching it in the attitude of the dog and horse and other domestic animals toward their masters. But man, as soon as he is able to attribute natural phenomena to a supernatural cause and power, manifests a crude religious feeling and emotion. He begins by believing in, fearing, and worshipping natural forces and objects, such as the sun, 
the moon, the wind, thunder and lightning, the ocean, rivers, mountains, etc. It is claimed that there is no natural object that has not been deified and worshipped by some people at some time in the history of the race. Later, man acquired the anthropomorphic conception of deities and created many gods in his own image, endowing them with his own attributes, qualities and characteristics. The mental characteristics and morals of a people can always be ascertained by a knowledge of the average conception of deity held by them. Polytheism, or the belief in many gods, was succeeded by monotheism, or belief in one god. Monotheism ranges from the crudest conception of a man-like god to the highest conception of a spiritual being transcending all human qualities, attributes or characteristics. Man began by believing in many god things, then in many god persons, then in one god person, then in one god who is a spirit, then in one universal spirit which is God. It is a far cry from the savage, man-like God of old to the conception of universal spirit of the God-drunken philosopher Spinoza. The extreme of religious belief is that which holds that there is nothing but God, all else is illusion, a pantheistic idealism. Buddhism, at least in its original form, discarded the idea of a supreme being, and held that ultimate reality is but universal law, hence the accusation that Buddhism is an atheistic religion, although it is one of the world's greatest religions, having over 400 million followers. But the beliefs of the religious person may be considered as resulting from intellectual processes. His religious feelings and emotions arise from another part of his mental being. It is the testimony of the authorities of all religions that religious conviction is an inner experience rather than an intellectual conception. The emotional element is always active in religious manifestations everywhere. The purely intellectual religion is naught but a philosophy. Religion without feeling and emotion is an anomaly. In all true religion there exists a feeling of inner assurance and faith, love, awe, dependence, submission, reverence, gratitude, hope, and perhaps fear. The emotional element must always be present, not necessarily in the form of emotional excess, as in the case of revival hysteria or the dance of the whirling dervishes, but at least in the form of the calm, fervent feeling of that peace which passeth understanding. When religion departs from the emotional phase, it becomes merely a school of philosophy or an ethical culture society. The student must not lose sight of the uplifting influence of true religious emotion by reason of his knowledge of its lowly origin. Like the lotus, which has its roots in the slimy, filthy mud of the river, and its stem in the muddy, stagnant and foul waters thereof, but its beautiful flower unfolded in the clear air and facing the sun, so is religious feeling responsible for some of the most beautiful and uplifting ideals and actions of the race. If its origin and history contain much that is not consistent with the highest ideals of the race today, it is not the fault of religion, but of the race itself. Religion, like all else in the universal manifestation, is under the laws of evolution, growth and development. What the religion of the future may be, we know not. But the prophets of the race are dreaming visions of a religion as much higher than that of today, as the latter is higher than the crude fetishism of the savage. The following quotation from John Fiske's Through Nature to God is appropriate in this place. Fiske says, My aim is to show that that other influence, that inward conviction, the craving for a final cause, the theistic assumption, is itself one of the master facts of the universe, and as much entitled to respect as any fact in physical nature can possibly be. The argument flashed upon me about ten years ago while reading Herbert Spencer's controversy with Frederick Harrison concerning the nature and reality of religion. Because Spencer derived historically the greater part of modern belief in an unseen world from the savage's primeval world of dreams and ghosts, 
some of his critics maintained that logical consistency required him to dismiss the modern belief as utterly false. Otherwise, he would be guilty of seeking to evolve truth from falsehood. By no means, replied Spencer. Contrarywise, the ultimate form of the religious consciousness is the final development of a consciousness which, at the outset, contained a germ of truth obscured by multitudinous errors. Fisk, in this connection, quotes the Tennysonian question, Who forged that other influence, that heat of inward evidence, by which he doubts against the sense? The religious emotions may be developed by allowing the mind to dwell upon the power underlying the universe of fleeting, changing forms, by reading prose and poetry, in which an appeal is made to the religious instinct, by listening to music, which awakens the emotion of reverence and awe, and finally, by meditating upon the inner spirit imminent in every living being. As an old Hindu sage once said, There are many paths by which men arrive at a knowledge of the presence of God, but there is but one goal and destination. End of chapter 15 End of section 6